I'm I'm a committed panpsychist. You know, I think that uh, uh, consciousness is really fundamental. I think it's built into nature at every level. You know, from the simplest to the most complex. I think that uh, it, it's it's just a part of the structure of reality. I think that what it really gets interesting, you know, is when you have accumulations of complexity out of complexity emerges complex consciousness i, I mean i think even you know electrons are you know, are conscious in a certain way everything is conscious in that it experiences its its beingness every tiny piece of the universe experiences its own beingness but not everything that experiences it can reflect on that experience. And I think that's what sets us apart, you know, and, and animals and other things also may have some degree of self-reflection, but I think it's the, you know, uh, as, as consciousness gets the, the structures that support consciousness become more complex, then consciousness itself becomes more complex and structured. But there is that tiny, iota the seed of consciousness the quantum seed maybe even of consciousness everywhere in nature at the low, lowest levels this is what i believe and uh that's reassuring that's comforting in some way and i think there's you know a good deal of evidence to argue for this if we accept the premise that intelligence or consciousness however you want to characterize it is built into nature that I think what we're seeing with this appearance of, you know, both directionality in time and uh, an appearance of, uh, it's not an appearance, it's, it's the experience of intentionality, you know, and I think, you know, I, I, I forget who said it, the physicist who said, well, you know, time is what, had to be put in place so everything doesn't happen at once, right? right. <laughs> Which makes sense. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, I, I do. I, I agree with that. That I think the universe is what we're perceiving with this apparent uh, emergence of intelligence, intentionality, which is also very much related to the directionality the arrow of time we like to have a sense that we're going somewhere you know it's it all is headed in some direction that may be a delusion but i do think what we're experiencing is it's the universe waking up to itself which which is pretty much what uh carl sagan said you know it's waking up i and and the design i i don't postulate uh, you know, an intelligent designer. I'm not, but the universe itself is the designer. The universe is self-organizing. So there is intelligence, intentionality, and all that just built into a structure as much as the, you know, gravitational constant or the speed of light or any of those things, you know. It's just a fundamental property of the way things are. You know, I mean, the ideas are challenging for if you're a materialist and a reductionist. So you have to really question your fundamental assumptions. And I think it it's it's easier to say, you know, reductionism is the operating model, and and you know what uh, you know what can't be measured is not real. I think to introduce consciousness into the equation in a certain way is uncomfortable for people that uh you know are not willing to accept all the variables and all the unanswered questions that uh that uh that introduces you know and determinism is kind of a comfortable place to be in a certain way you can say well it's it's all just electrons and atoms and things moving about and there's nothing to it you know it's that it's just this thing that plays out but that goes against our our strongest intuitions you know 
Uh, and which is not to say that our strongest intuitions can't be totally wrong. I just, I just, here's the thing. The reductionist model does not explain consciousness and experience. It's an inner experience. And, and we know that exists because we are living it every second of our lives, you know? So I, I think this highlights the inherent limitations of that approach and, and the inherent limitations of the scientific approach in general. You know, I mean, I, I, and science is very powerful. Uh, and I don't dismiss it. I don't disrespect it. But I think it's also important to recognize its limitations. It's, you know, I mean, the, the Cartesian error that we made back in the day that, you know, there's the rest extension, the rest interior, whatever, and these two will never meet. I think that has really sort of compromised the integration of our, uh, you know, the datum of our subjective experience, which is undeniable. And as a matter of fact, you know, there is nothing else, you know, that everything we experience is part of this world that, that the brain and the mind and the sensory apparatus and all that construct, you know, and that we inhabit. It's, it's not reality. It's a model of reality. But, you know, we all experience this. And it's very hard to fit that into a reductionist, uh, you know, reductionist worldview. So you come up against the, that conundrum and the reductionist would just rather say, well, you know, we can't really talk about it. We don't want to think about it. And it has nothing to do with the way the universe is anyway. And it, and it obviously has everything to do with the way the universe is because there is no experience of reality without it. I mean, this is the whole, you know, this is, you know, pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty difficult epistemological territory in a certain way. I mean, it's the old conundrum, you know, does a tree fall in the forest? Does it make a noise if nobody is there to perceive it? You know, and it's interesting that uh, uh, these these kinds of questions come up. I was recently at a podcast a few days ago about uh, entities, psychedelic entities, encountered, you know, in psychedelic states. Many people have experienced this. Some always do. Other people, not all the time, but sometimes there's a strong sense of contact with some other intelligent. Are they objectively real? And how do you establish that? If they are, how do you test that in this space? You know, the point I made in the forum, the point we're making here is I think anything that we experience is real. In fact, we have nothing beyond experience. So in that sense, those entities, our experience of them is real. Are the entities real? Yes. But are they out really, there really in some real. hyper are dimension really or yeah. are they some part of ourselves or, you know, I keep, uh, I often like to quote what J. Allen Hynek said about UFOs, that he was a famous UFO researcher, and he said, I don't know if UFOs are real, but I'm 100% certain that UFO experiences are real. So same thing applies. These entities are experienced. Are they part of ourselves presenting as something that is not ourselves, or are they objectively whatever that means, real, separate from you, another intelligence somewhere. I think we just don't know. What One of the, uh, uh, you know, my, my brother, when he would take mushrooms off, and he always liked to take them by himself and get into these deep states, and he would become in communication with these, with intelligences, you know, or, or in dialogue with something. And he was always trying to say, how do I know you're real? Can you tell me something that I cannot possibly know? And then if you can, you know, I'll know that you're real. 
but then you but then how do you define i mean how do you define something you can't possibly build you know because if you conceive of it then you can possibly know it so it's just a mess <laughs> you know their their obvious therapeutic utility you know uh their their use have been used in traditional uh medicine for thousands of years for healing now science is kind of rediscovering this as though it's something new you know but but i guess what's new is the science therapeutics is discovering that they can be used to address a lot of these mental disorders and within that framework you know which is not the same framework that indigenous medicine operates but within the more clinical framework they can say well yeah there's you know we've got different mental uh disorders like uh you know excuse me major depressive disorder and you know uh addiction trauma all of that thing and these things are really among the most effective treatments that we found for this you know to the point where uh, a lot of the conventional treatments that were available before, uh, you know, it, it they really put into perspective how inadequate those things were, you know, like antidepressants and that sort of thing, because they're basically uh, band-aids, you know, they don't really get to the root of the problem. Psychedelics are a what route to get to the root of the problem, and I think the main uh, therapeutic potency of psychedelics is that they let you step out of outside of this normal reference frame and outside the box, outside the default mode network, if you want to put it that way. Look at your problems, whatever they might be, from a different perspective. And in that way, understand how to disable them or how to resolve them. So you've got the whole therapeutic side, which is kind of like obvious, right? I mean, early psychedelic researchers back even in the 50s and 60s were using LSD to treat alcoholism and that sort of thing with very spectacular results. But it was all kind of ignored after the war on drugs came along and that sort of thing. So psychedelics are important because they're a class of compounds that could really revolutionized mental health care, you know, in, in, as they're integrated into medicine, and they will have to transform mental health care and, and practices if that's happened, that, that if that happens, and that's why it's so difficult. But then on the other side of it, and maybe more important in a way to people like you and me who are preoccupied with consciousness, they are simply the most powerful tools that we that have come along for exploring consciousness and exploring the the depths of both the uh, you know conscious universe and and the so called unconscious. I guess in the process of exploring the unconscious, you, you know what that results is with is a, a, a gradual accumulating, uh, you know the the more you explore it, the more you bring it, the unconscious, bring the dark into the light, you know, and assimilate it into consciousness. Uh, Freud said that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious, maybe one of the roads, but I think that psychedelics are clearly a road to the unconscious. So these are the, uh, you know, uh, I was rereading a portion of my book. I think I talked them talked about these things as being the the chemical starships that we that we took to explore the universe within even as we look towards space and the usual or conventional kind of craft so i don't know but i i think that's really you know this is the this is the fundamental this is the fundamental challenge really for neuroscience and by extension for all of all of science everything in our in our effort to understand the universe and our place in it you know what is consciousness i mean that is the big 
question, you know, and if, uh, if we can explain consciousness, then, you know, that leads to a, a, a unified field theory that is at least equivalent to anything the physicists are, are uh, trying to construct, you know, and not necessarily even different from it. So, so that's the thing. Psychedelics are tools for exploring consciousness and, and what that is and what the underpinnings of it are, you know. And, and I also think uh, something that maybe is not being uh, remarked upon too much, but I think it's worth remarking on, Psychedelics are, you know, we, we usually think of psychedelics as something that, uh, you know, science should study, right? But psychedelics are also, you can think of them as scientific instruments. They can be a lens through which you can study everything else. You know, you can, you can use the psychedelic experience to examine nature and view it in a way that you've never viewed it before, which is, you know, essentially the same reason that it's therapeutic. You, you get to step outside your box and look at things from a different perspective. Well, you could look at nature itself from outside your box, put your scientific assumptions and prejudices aside, and just examine the phenomena in nature from the standpoint of being in a psychedelically altered state, you know, and that opens up, I think, tremendous learning opportunities, you know, uh, an indigenous person doesn't necessarily have to be on a psychedelic, but I think indigenous people, and to a certain extent, children, before they have their cognitive, you know, functions uh, trained to filter everything out, you know, which is a lot of what the brain does. Uh, but if you're more open to it, if, if if you or I go out to the forest with an indigenous per person, they're going to notice things and be aware of things that we are not, you know, uh, at least until they point them out, you know, because we work within this sort of reductive system of filters and that, you know, they just don't fit into the particular reality hallucination that we're constructing for ourselves. That's not to say they're not real. I mean, you can see how that shift in perspective can happen. And and in some instances, you know, there are tales where scientists had these kinds of experiences and they obtained insights from it, like Terry Mullis, for example, winning the Nobel Prize for the for the PCR discovery, and he was very upfront about the fact that his LSD experiences afforded him the insight to visualize how this system worked, to you know get down among the molecules as he talked about it, and uh, so it's not like it's you know it it's a valid observation. You know, it stands up in the cold light of the day after, and then you could look back, reflect back, and say, "Yeah, this was a real insight. This wasn't just stone fantasy. This was a real insight about a process of nature." And so, I think they're tremendously useful for that, and I'd like to see more of that. You know, I'd like to uh, yeah, organize. Uh, retreats of people with different specialties, mathematicians or molecular biologists or, you know, quantum physicists and that sort of thing. Get them all together, let them take something like psilocybin or ayahuasca and then share data and see what they come up with. I think this could be really very useful. This is the, this is a war on consciousness. I think Graham Hancock has used that yeah, term. Yeah. It's not about the war on drugs. It's about the war on consciousness. And, you know, I often said, uh, my brother said, and I repeated, but he said, you know, it's not, psychedelics are not pr not prohibited because they're dangerous. They're pr prohibited because they give you dangerous ideas. 
you know, and really the focus is on the ideas that come from from psychedelic psychedelic insights, you know. And this has been, you know, the current war on drugs, which is now becoming kind of we it's it's obviously failed totally, and maybe we're moving beyond that now, and and society is getting more open, but. It seems to me that religion for, you know, at least since the Judeo-Christian religions have been, you know, one of their major agenda is to suppress this kind of inquiry because it's inconvenient. I mean, the whole stance is religions are not about giving you answers. They're about making you stop asking questions. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's, exactly. that's really what it is. It's like, Here's a set of doctrines, a set of beliefs. You just have to accept that. Stop asking all these pesky questions. Told the lie. That oh, and uh, and and by the way, give us some money. Oh, and give us some money. Yes, right, right. <laughs> so, so uh, that's you know, I, 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 I think religions are are very toxic and dangerous in this sense, and and the the governmental uh, prohibition of of these psychedelics is just an extension of that, basically. You know, uh, the war on drugs has yeah. been going on for a long, long time. As our society matures and gets used to the idea of psychedelics, I think there are a couple of tracks that this is going to unfold in. Uh, one is the medical, clinical clinical application of these things. And that that's what the big pharma is interested in and so on. And then, and there are plenty of opportunities for greed and, you know, uh, all of those things to uh, kind of poison the waters there. But at the same time, I think, at the, I mean, the, one of the issues is that the clinical use of psychedelics becomes accepted. This may be something that only elites can afford. You know, if you want a clinical psychedelic psilocybin session you have to go to a clinic and pay 30 grand and you know and then you can get it and some can afford that and i would say that's fine if they can afford it that's out of most people's reach so i'm very encouraged by the also the other side of this which is many people would prefer to use natural medicines and we should look to changing the regulatory environment so that that's possible. I, I fundamentally believe that no plant, no organism should be illegal or, or criminalized or whatever. I just, the very idea is appalling. We are just one of millions of species on this planet. What gives us the right to declare uh, yeah. some other species anathema and prohibited? So we need to change the regulatory viewpoint. And if these plants, fungi, and so on are decriminalized to to a point where people can use them, then I think what you're going to see is there is already an, in, an existing infrastructure for creating therapeutic uh, environments that are resemble indigenous practices more than clinical practices. You know, I mean, ritual and this sort of thing, very important. And uh, uh, I think this could be tremendously beneficial for society if every community or, you know, had a place you could go that would provide these types of therapies, maybe in conjunction with other types of oh, absolutely. spiritual practices, yoga or whatever massage, nutritional counseling, you name it, the whole spectrum of sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternative uh, alternative health practice and psychedelics could be just one thing on the menu. It, it, you know, there have been studies, for example, uh, Roland Griffiths and Franz Volzheider, people like that, have done clinical studies with uh, uh, psilocybin and long-term meditators and you know, the states of mind are very compatible, you know, and, and often very similar. And I think that people say, well, psychedelics are unnatural. Uh, fact is, they reflect every 
again, this comes back to the raw datum of experience. Everything you experience is a reflection of your neurochemical brain state at that particular moment. And, you know, meditation is as much a drug trip as taking a psychedelic is because we're made of drugs, right? We are made of drugs. So consciousness is something that rides or, or you know, we're a biochemical engine that generates consciousness or that, you know, it, 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 what we experience is a reflection of these inner neurochemical processes. So it's, it's not correct to say that uh, psychedelics are not natural and meditative experiences are natural. They're, they're all within the context of nature, and, and they're very similar. And, and I think that it's just a, uh, you know, it, it, it's just not correct to say that because you didn't ingest the substance and the experience you have with meditation is somehow superior or more natural. I don't think, or you didn't ingest a substance, but you generated all the neurotransmitters in your brain that supported that experience. So it's a false dichotomy, really, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I think there's another aspect to using the, the natural psychedelics that is, uh, you know, that recommends them in a certain way because these are co-evolutionary catalysts for our species. You know, we've co-evolved with them possibly over millions of years. We're continuing to do that. And so this symbiotic partnership comes back to the idea that no plant should be, uh, should be prohibited. No, none of these organisms should be prohibited. And the, next extension of that is uh, I, I think we need to assert the right to symbiosis you know as a fundamental right not even limited to human because we're talking about symbiosis as a partnership with different species so it's a fundamental organismic right people should have the right to form a symbiotic relationship with any organism they want you know, as long as it doesn't bring harm to others. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, and that is just something, I mean, I, I don't think they're exactly codifying this into, uh, into uh, drug policy laws, but that, that is what it should be. That is where that conversation should be, in my opinion. And are you familiar with the work of Suzanne Samard? The name sounds familiar, but I don't want to say I'm too... He's a forester, uh, a forest ecologist from the University of British Columbia, and she's written this book. She's written many scientific papers, and, and but a popular book called Finding the Mother Tree. And she is the person that's articulated the idea that these old-growth forest ecosystems essentially are nervous systems. You know, they are linked together by these mycorrhizal networks, these these networks of roots and fungi intertwined under the ground, and that they actually do function in a regulatory way like nervous systems, you know, slow nervous systems, but mediated by neurotransmitter-like molecules, you know, the translocation of molecules between the plants in the soil and they, these old growth trees, which are an essential part of it, function essentially like ganglionic nodes or brains or whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it, that really ties these ecosystems together and uh, gives them coherence and consciousness. Yes, in a certain way their own consciousness see this this is one of the things that you know one of the one of the challenges of consciousness and looking for consciousness elsewhere in nature whether you're looking out in space or somewhere on this earth how you will you recognize consciousness when you see it you know uh, an, an intelligent alien being may not look like anything we would call maybe maybe mushrooms are conscious i don't know 
you know, but you wouldn't automatically say, you know, this is clearly a conscious being as opposed to, you know, a fox or something like that. But foxes and people are very similar because we all have, you know, we're mammals. We have these complex uh, nervous systems, foxes less so than are, but basically. And so there's much less perceived distance, you know. One of the things uh, I have uh, sort of drawn my conclusion, my, my discussions of these these aliens, these entities that you encounter on psychedelics, you know, I keep coming back and I wonder if the alien that we should be looking for is right here on the earth. And the alien is essentially the biosphere, you know, which is an intelligent super organism. It's a collection of all organisms that works in symbiosis. And is it conscious? Depends on how you can find, define consciousness. But I think it's conscious in the sense that all of these symbiotic systems, these feedback loops and everything that maintain the, the conditions on the planet within the parameters that are tolerable for life is a reflection of its ability to actually ant actively intervene in the geochemical, geophysical forces that maintain the planet and maintain them within these parameters of tolerability. Of course, we are the, we're like the fleas on the planet. We're, we're disrupting this as quickly as we can. We're not playing by the rules. And this is part of what is so worrisome. You know, we've gotten outside the, the uh, out of control in a certain way as these homeostatic systems. But I think the alien that we should be trying to contact is the collectivity of the biosphere. And, and you know, psychedelics are one way to do that. There may be others too. I, I think that, uh, you know, when you talk about technologies, any psychedelics are technology. Right. You know, right. drugs are technology. All of these things, fire is a technology. I think that what's happened is our our cleverness has outpaced our wisdom. You know, we've gone through this very period, very rapid period of technological change. We have these capabilities that 200 years ago we couldn't even imagine, you know, and now we have them, including control of information on a global scale. We've essentially extruded our nervous system onto the planet as a whole through the internet. So now, you know, they are, you often talk about uh, the way the Earth is structured. Uh, planetary scientists talk about, you know, the the lithosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and so on. We also need to talk about the phytosphere and the ethnosphere and the cybersphere, the neurosphere. The, some of these things are in part, well, the phytosphere is simply the the layer of plants uh, on the planet and the mycosphere. These are natural things, but the the, the uh, cybersphere is maybe a reflection of human symbiosis with technology. Well, our cleverness has outpaced our wisdom. Yeah. In other words, we can do a lot of things and are going to be able to do even more things that are inherently quite dangerous if they're misused. I mean, one obvious example is nuclear energy, but, uh, you know, you can also point to nanotechnology and genetic engineering and, you know, pharmaceutical technology. All of these things are technologies. I'm a believer that technology inherently doesn't have any moral qualities. The moral qualities come from within us. So we have the cleverness to do things, not necessarily the wisdom to look at it thoughtfully and say, just because we can do it, should we do it? And that's where that's where we're up against some challenges because the often the perception is if we can do it, it must be done and it will be done. 
not necessarily. We should have the wisdom to step back from it and say, just because we can, you know, create black holes in the Hadron Collider, should we do that, considering there's very small probability, but nonetheless not zero, that that would collapse the space-time continuum. I mean, this is not something that we have to worry about, but I, I think you're getting you get what I'm talking about. We have to be very wise about how we deploy our technological capabilities. And that has to come from a moral ethical perspective, not just a, you know, gee whiz, we are scientists, we can do anything. You know, that's an attitude that will lead to perdition and probably the end of life on earth. So we have to be you know, I'm always saying in my podcast, whatever, we have to wake up to what's happening. But the next step is we have to wise up, you know, and we have to become wise about how we go forward. And it's very hard to do that in the frenzy of the moment. And that's another that's another place where psychedelics can help because they can let you step out of that and look at these processes and gain wisdom, really, that you can then take with you back into ordinary space and maybe it's going to influence how you behave, who you talk to, what you do going forward. Uh, I'm not saying if everyone on the planet took psychedelics, it would all be good, you know, but I do think that more people need to take them. And I think that, you know, the right people need to take them in a certain sense. I'm not being elitist, but I think that people, uh, you know, with a with we're in a position to influence absolutely policy and sort of the shaping of the future they should really be encouraged to take psychedelics but i'm concerned it's not happening fast enough you know i mean it's like every time you turn around the window but that separates us between you know total disaster on the on the planetary level gets narrower and narrower and narrower. We don't have the the luxury anymore to uh uh to say, well, you know, we have thirty years, we can figure this out. No, not anymore. You know, we have maybe ten years if we're lucky, you know. I mean not that we're gonna bring all of life to an end in ten years, but I think we're gonna reach a tipping point where we realize it's really too late. You know, we cannot save it now. But I don't think we're there yet, but we're closing in on that rather quickly. So that's a pretty grim prospect. We're all being bored along by this. So, you know, you just do what you do. Just do what you what you're doing, what I'm doing, what other people are doing. Just keep talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Hoping you can get the message out and and hoping that uh people with, you know, capabilities, but also an ethical you know, an ethical uh uh framework can kind of step up and, and try to slow it down. I, I don't see much I mean, I see a lot that uh, that indicates that not, that's not happening. But the difference is that the you know the bad things get all the attention. There are a lot yeah. of good things going on too, and they happen much more quietly. They tend to happen outside the spotlight of the media and so on. So you can't really say. I guess it's just the way it's ever been. But is it by design? I. Uh, you know, I, I hope not. I mean, you and me it, both. if it's, I, I don't think so, actually. I think that nobody has the big picture. Nobody is actually controlling things, you know, and never really has. There's always been uh... this polarized dynamic, you know, but nobody is in control because nobody knows at the end of the day what the fuck is going on. Exactly. Exactly.